in five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the VIP Collective. Today, we are sitting with Toronto wedding officiant, Teddy the Marrying Lady. Hello, Teddy. Hello. Thank you for having me on your it's podcast. So nice to see you. So we actually met in 2017, just for a bit of background for everyone who's listening. Uh, you were officiating a ceremony that we were a client that we were working on as well. So we kind of crossed paths back then. So it's nice to see you again. It has been a while. Absolutely. But wonderful video from that wedding. Oh, well, you yeah. were giving a beautiful narrative with the ceremony. And I think that's one thing that I've, I've been following you since. And I'm always seeing, you know, your posts and your advice. And you're always, your ceremonies are very personal. And they mm -hmm. feel very personalized. And you're just lovely. So I thought, why not bring on, you would be our very first efficient to be on the podcast. Oh, my goodness. Thank <laughs> you. That is an honor. <laughs> So I'm excited to get a bit of a perspective from you. Uh, what I thought would be really interesting today and in bringing you on is I think a lot of people now, especially with postponements of weddings, are thinking, you know, some of the ceremonies may get a little bit more intimate moving forward. And one thing I noticed with you is um, you always encourage, you know, your couples if they want to do their personalized vows or however they want to do vows. But I thought what might be interesting and to kind of change things up a bit is if we talked about some of the steps of writing your vows and how you kind of advise couples to do that. So that's where I want to go today. But before we do that, I do want to hear a little bit of background about you. So let's fill everybody in kind of on when you started in the industry and how you got into the business of love. I, I fell into it. I basically, I lived in Scotland for four years and studied the original wedding ceremony where they would tie the hands. It got popular on Game of Thrones. And so when I came back to Canada, my friends were getting married. I would say, you should try this. It's a very interesting aspect of commitment because each year you recommit. So it says, no, I'm not going to take you for granted or I need to respect you because I recognize that you choose to be with me. Um, so I started doing it for friends at like as part of the ceremony being pulled in and then I had friends who say can you just do the whole ceremony ah yes of course I do the whole ceremony somebody would do the legal work and then they said well can you just do the legal work too I said how hard could it be I'll just go on the internet <laughs> I've watched it on friends uh, it's not it's not easy in Ontario it takes a long time you have to be licensed you cannot just get it off the internet and boom, you're ready to go. So that kind of started me in doing, you know, just the odd weddings just for fun. But then I did the mass ceremony uh, in 2014 for World Pride at Casa Loma. And once I did that, it's the largest wedding ceremony in North America. And that's really what, that's when things really started to, to roll as the marrying lady. Oh, wow. So did you give yourself the marrying lady or was that what you kind of kept hearing in the background? <laughs> no, a friend's child would say, uh, oh, you're putting on your heel highs. Are you going off to be the marrying lady? Oh, and, uh, yeah, so it was just so adorable. And I thought that's pretty, it's pretty clear what I do. Like that's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. So yeah, it's stuck. That's a good name. Well done. So what year did you start? Like when were you in Scotland and when did that kind of unfold? So I left Scotland in 2003. Um, I, I did the first ceremony in 2016 and legally like a few years after that. So 2012, I don't, who knows? <laughs> I, don't. <laughs> I don't even know what day or month it is right now. So <laughs> it's hard to even go back that far. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was 2016 was the first one. And then I did another one out in Newfoundland and then became legal so I could do them in, in Ontario. But I mean, it's just the best job in the world not to, you know, put down any other wedding jobs. But <laughs> I, 
What is that? <laughs> what do you, what is it that you love about it so much? Oh my goodness. It's addictive. Like you're basically, you're in this little bubble of pure emotions, whether that's um, nervousness or excitement or just some people just like who's love all over each other and you get to be in that intimate space and kind of create that environment with all of their guests to really be pulled in and feel that excitement and make it an actual experience as opposed to just watching a show and um and of course the other aspect is that it's like i used to travel around the world in my 20s and marrying couples is like traveling around the world mentally because you get couples in Toronto from every different background, every different, you know, culture, faith, um, even just different ideas. So it's constantly changing and, and it's creative and you get to work with them on something really creative and exciting and personalized that, that makes them super happy to, to want to take that step. Well, that was my next question, actually. So before the ceremony, you're obviously meeting with them and you're probably learning a little bit about them. So do you think that those meetings help build up a little bit more of excitement moving towards the ceremony because you're guiding them with, you know, with their vows and things like that. The yeah, meeting. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, even from the initial meeting, when we have an initial conversation, like, who are you? What's your love story? You know, how'd you meet? Have you been to other weddings? Um, quite often at that stage, I, I get to learn a lot about them. But the other thing that I do is, I'll extract information from their love story and their style and go into my tickle trunk of 101 wedding samples that sounds like it would be a good starter draft for them and then kind of break it down what I do, when I do it, why I do it, and why things work a certain way. Because mm -hmm. I have a certain style of how I like, how I know things flow well. And once I explain it and they get that real, they go from being like, oh, wedding ceremony, you know, I think we just say vows, exchange rings and sign some papers. But when you actually break it down for them, they start getting this really clear idea of the flow of how it can flow and, and they get excited from <laughs> just yeah. the prospect of getting a ceremony. They haven't even received anything yet, but it's um, insightful to be able to physically or mentally get an idea of what it's physically going to seem like. Right. Right. And then it seems like you're building a bit more meaning behind it as well. Other yeah. than the readings but there's like a meaning because it was picked because of a certain thing something like that yeah or even just ways to um if they're nervous there are different things that we can do to kind of alleviate that kind of nervousness um like what we... give so, us some tricks <laughs> so one thing that if a, if a couple's really nervous um what i recommend is that we do affirmation of family and friends and so before we even get started, and I'm telling everyone to turn off their cell phones, I get their guests really excited by telling them that there's a point in the ceremony where I will seek their participation. Mm -hmm. And then I'll practice with them and give them that permission to be loud and clap and cheer and kind of like recognize that there's a part they're gonna play in the ceremony, that they're not just watching a show, that they are part of that ceremony, right? Mm -hmm. So then just before they do their vows, if doing their vows is kind of a, a probably the most nerve wracking aspect of it, especially if they're reading them, uh, having that affirmation where I say to the family and friends, um, do you give these two your blessing and support and wish them a wonderful life together? And everyone goes, yeah, woo! And you, and you just realize, like you get that sense, like you're supported here. You're surrounded by people who love you. They're not sitting there quietly judging you. You know, they've got your back, so just, let those vows flow and, and know you're loved, right? So it's like opening up a space where your guests can be active and actively supporting you. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And some deep breaths, I suppose. Yeah, deep breaths. But also I do what I call a walkthrough before the actual wedding. It's not the big rehearsal. It's just the three of us physically going through all of it so that they get a physical sense of what is going to happen which means that they're less mentally and physically kind of nervous. They can just, you know, sink into it a little bit better. Right. And, and they get to spend time with me so they can just trust that I'm there to facilitate. All they have to do is show up, 
They don't have to remember anything from the walkthrough. I will just, you know, be there to guide them. But when I'm whispering to them, they'll know <laughs> what it's about and they'll know which hand to take. And, you know, all the things that you can get nervous about, they at least physically know what's going to happen. So. Mm -hmm. And so that's another, that's another thing that I noticed uh, when working with you is that your approach with the vows becomes a little bit more where you kind of tuck, tuck and hide yourself and allow them to kind of share that. And you're, you're operating more as like the whisperer. <laughs> is that something that you kind of developed over the years? You felt like just felt yeah. more authentic or? For, I do it for the vows and for the rings, right? Because I, the vow shouldn't be something where I'm demanding them to <laughs> repeat. It, it always felt like that. It was more of a demand than something that was warm and sincere, right? Right. So by standing beside them, often what I could do is if they are getting nervous, I could put my hand on their back. And that can be just that reassurance you're doing well. Um, me whispering is calming for them. And I'm whispering their vows so that basically everyone hears them saying their vows as opposed to me telling it. Can you give an example of anything that you, that stood out? Like obviously you've seen hundreds, maybe even thousands. I'm not even sure of weddings. <laughs> but do you remember one specifically that was super new, unique to something they had done? Oh my gosh. I know. That is... Um... Or even a location that was something super special. There's so many to choose from. Like there's, I will tell you, you know, I will tell you this. The coolest, not the coolest wedding. I hate to, I hate to judge any wedding as being cooler than, because they're all so different, right? But surprise weddings are amazing. Hmm. Amazing. So I've had a couple I've had a, quite a few surprise weddings, one in which the groom didn't even know he was getting married, <laughs> which is highly unusual because you need to sign the marriage application. Right. Right? You can't just surprise, like, what if they say no? I was so nervous. But apparently this groom had been begging her to marry him for 14 years, and he was having his 50th, at, uh, 50th birthday uh, celebration with all of his family and friends, and they were all dressed up in different decades. And then she has me come out and announcing that the birthday gift is there will be a wedding. The crowd goes wild. He's like in tears. He's so excited. Like it just, it just, you can't beat that kind of excitement. Oh, right? that's cute. <laughs> and there's no stress in the buildup. I had right. another couple that, um, they didn't tell their families at all. They basically told their, their parents and grandparents that they were going to take them out for a special dinner to make an announcement. So they believed that that was going to be an engagement announcement. So then the couple gets a friend to go pick up a limo, picks them up, hands them a note, tells them they've got 10 minutes to get ready. They're coming to a wedding, grab their cameras. And by the time that they've picked everybody up, starting with, their, with her mom, they went into her mom's backyard put up some decorations, took, laid out some food. And when the limo came back, the parents, grandparents got out, came into the backyard. Like the smiles on people, like they're just mm -hmm. giddy. Like they're more excited than the couple sometimes. They're just so excited by the surprise. Oh, that's cute. Um, what about the first kiss? Now, I feel like sometimes some couples get a little bit nervous about the first kiss. Do you see that a lot or... Do you kind of just tell people go with what works? Oh gosh, I'm a little more hands-on than I would imagine any officiant ever dares to be. The first kiss? Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you know, I, I slowly, I, I wasn't doing it in the beginning and I was really, oh, I don't know if I should tell you this. Or, so basically couples would kiss and they would be holding hands and they would kiss like precious moment dolls, like where it's just like precious <laughs> And so, so I would say to the couples, I'm like, look, I need you to kiss two times. And they're like, what? Two times? I'm like, two times. The one, your photographer wants to get the, the shot right on. And if they're off to the side, they're going to miss it. And they're going to miss that great shot. Two, the best kiss is, and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir. The best kiss isn't the squishy face kiss. It's like the almost kiss. So if you kiss them like you mean it the first time, go in for that second or third kiss, you're going to get that really magical shot. 
and they're like, okay, okay, two kisses. I'm like, yeah, next. And this is obviously just for hetero couples, but I say to the groom, I'm like, what are you going to do? Because as you know, in photography with women, it's all about uh, curves and with men, it's the straight angles. So I'm like, you put your hand in the small of her back and you pull her in towards you. Mm. And I've had, I've had men who are like, this has changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know you feel it you can yeah. I had a couple here and I, I his mother was here from Sweden she didn't speak a word of English and I did that exercise during the walkthrough and the first time they kissed she didn't do anything second time when I'm like pull her in and the mom was like Whoa! <laughs> because it's, it just it's passionate and it right. you feel held and you feel like it just yeah perfect. Perfect. and it gives you it's almost like it's giving you that curve like you said the dip and then the crowd goes wild. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's such a passionate, loving embrace. And it just, whoop. Amazing. That's a hot tip. Good that stuff. Is a hot tip. That is a hot tip. <laughs> um, so let's move into the vow portion because I really want to dive into this because we see a lot of it too. We sometimes see repeat vows. We sometimes see personalized vows. Everybody's got a different flavor for what they want to do. So what are some of the steps that you walk through with the couples when you're talking them through what the ceremony is going to look like. So um, two things, if they are, because we're talking about nervous couples and how to deal with nerds. Um, if they're not comfortable actually doing personalized vows in front of everyone, mm -hmm. what I recommend is still writing those vows out because it will be a document that, rem that reminds you of how you were feeling on that day. Put those vows in a box, like some people put them in wine boxes or, or just something, put it away so that Five years from now, 10 years from now, you can go back and read them. And you don't necessarily have to do it in front of everyone if you choose not to. So that's first of all. Would they write them in the morning during prep? <gasps> no. They, so as soon as you're engaged. Oh, when you're engaged. As soon as the couple contacts me, books me, and I send them their draft ceremony, I send them the link to go to my website for videos on how to personalize your own wedding vows which is basically a video that I ask key questions to really understand the foundation of how you felt when you first met, how you knew you were in love, things where you can just write out, take notes, keep it by the bedside, little things that happen, but to do it as soon as you get engaged because yeah. you are engaged with one another for that duration. Mm -hmm. And so engage with what it is about that person and go deep into that. So that's, that's typically what I do to kind of get them started. But as a tip, my biggest tip, the tip I'm always going on about is when you get engaged, do not Google anything. Do not Google anything. <laughs> like the world of Google and weddings is whew, huge out there, right? Yeah. But to personalize a ceremony, to personalize your vows, it's not out there where other people have done things. It's literally in your homes when you look around, it's in your hobbies, it's in your interests, it's in what you like to do when you're together, or, you know, it's really, it's already there. So in writing your vows, really just look at what it is that moves the two of you together, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other tip I always give, if a couple has been together for a long time, um, sometimes they're like, everybody knows our love story. Like we really don't need that in our wedding ceremony. It's really not that, you know, um, or our vows, it's really not that big. But I always tell them like, think of the times you've had crazy obstacles in your life, like a, a water pipe burst, or you go on a bad camping trip, or, you know, overcoming something that was a little bit nutty, but that the two of you, because you're, you're a good team, you managed to overcome. And it's in recognizing it's because of humor or because of logic or because one saves money well. <laughs> it's because of these little things that you admire about each other that makes you a good team. And that makes for great content. Mm -hmm. Love it. And then the number one vow thing that I, I don't necessarily tell couples, but I recommend is you can never, the one thing you cannot do in your vows, because it never goes over well, 
you cannot make fun of the other person unless you are doing so in such a way that you are offering to help them with that shortcoming. Right. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. Right? It has to be a loving approach to whatever. What's an example? <laughs> um, so, you know, you could say, I will, um, I will always clean up after your wine glass. I always pick up your wine glasses uh, the next morning that are, or your socks that are always left on the couch. Or, you know, like, so it's right. those little, little habits that people have that instead, and it's like saying, instead of getting upset with the, those shortcomings or those little habits that you have, I will, in a loving way, overlook that and just accept that that's my life and I will, and I'll do my best to, to kind of support you so that we still have harmony in our relationship. This is the tip, not so much with the writing of the vows, um, but when couples are actually going to read their vows, I will hand them to them so they're not pulling them out of, you know, mm. their dresses or whatever, you know, uh, to give me the vows, so I'll hand them over to you. But what I recommend that they do is they put them on a heavier stock of uh, paper, like almost like a postcard stock of paper. Okay. And to consider when they're holding them, that if they're shaky or nervous, that actually gives it a little more stability when they're holding it. But also if they are similar, if they're both on the same kind of cardstock, it's also the moment that when photos are being taken, that they can actually see from their expressions what they're doing. They're like, ah, oh, that's when we did our vows. It's very clear because they're holding, you know, something that looks good. You know, sometimes people have it match their decor so it looks extra mm. nice. Um, but it also makes it for a bit of a, a keepsake as well when you have it on um, like a heavier stock, right? Yeah. And it also helps from giving you a sense of how long to make it. People always ask, how long should your vows be? And I never want to answer that question because it's personal and it's up to you. But 253 words is a nice starter. <laughs> 253. 253 words. That's like, <laughs> that's like a good length. If you go a little bit over, a little bit under, it's like that is a, a, a solid length to get in some good points and still you know feel like it's too comfortable yeah. so like a little bit more than a tweet <laughs> two tweets <laughs> yes. but if you give 253 words then because often couples don't want to share their vows ahead of time they want it to be a surprise or personal in the moment so if you kind of give them a number set then they're at least working on having a balance of vows together i see do any couples work on their vows together like is that something they prefer to do Absolutely. So in my video series, the second video, which is way more boring than the first one, the second, <laughs> the second video is basically, I always say don't watch the videos because they're really embarrassing. Just put them on in the background while you're like doing dishes or something so that you're Treat not- Treat it scared. as a podcast. Is that what you Yeah. Mean? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, um, the second one is all about different styles of doing vows. Because often we think it's one person reads, next person reads. Um, but there are different ways of doing it. Some have said the exact same thing line by line to each other um, as a way of like affirming with one another that one statement and they'd read all the statements like that. Others have done it where they read, they go back and forth each saying something different. So it's like they're weaving their ceremony or weaving their vows into the ceremony. Um, That's a nice touch too. It's a bit more storytelling, like with a bit of a storytelling touch, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but more or less just, I'm, I'm sure there's more on that video. I haven't watched it for a while. <laughs> but, it's, I'm, you know, just have fun with it and be creative. All it is is basically that moment for you to share verbally what it is that you want to commit to one another before you do the physical act of, you know, solidifying that, which is usually like rings or whatever the right. physical thing you're doing. Yeah. What do you recommend when it comes to readings? Do you have, like, how does a couple pick what reading suits best, suits them best? Okay, this is a good question because I often get asked, can you send us some, some readings? Okay. So, number one, don't Google it. <laughs> I don't Stay off Google. <laughs> don't Google it at first, at first. And the reason for not Googling it at first is that Again, it's a matter you truly have to sit back, look at your styles, 
what it is you want for your theme, your message, and really look deep into what you want to feel and hear and what represents you in that moment. So, I mean, that the readings, there's so many readings. You can have things that are funny, lighthearted, romantic, um, serious, you know, all about marriage, love, commitment. Like you need to look at your relationship and really think, are we fun? Are we sincere? Do we want it to be like something that really solidif like makes us, is it something that is our favorite? Um, and, and then when I say reading, the one thing that I always resist, I'm like, forget the idea of a reading. It doesn't have to be a reading. It can be your favorite song lyrics. It can be movie quotes. It can be messages you've given to one another. It can be your bridal party, each writing a, a sentence as a word of wisdom in yeah. whatever way, if you trust them, and like <laughs> putting that together as a way of weaving them in. Or it can be, sometimes people have children or they're you know, bringing kids in. So sometimes it can be a reading that's more intended to kind of show the kids that they're being recognized in the wedding ceremony too, right? So yeah. have fun with it, but it comes from within, not Google at first. <laughs> yeah, first, it's like when you have symptoms, don't go to Google, it's the same with a wedding. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Um, we had an experience like that uh, this February. We were away in the Bahamas, and it was two families that were merging, and they both had both um, the bride and the groom had two, a daughter each, and the daughters were only one year apart from each other, and so they had done the couple had done their vows, and then the little girls came up and presented their own vows. That and just made me cry. It was very sweet, and they were both so excited to be joining as a family and becoming sisters because they didn't they didn't have sisters obviously so it was a pretty cute it was it was a really really cute ceremony how old were the girls they were five and six this is the perfect age yeah like nobody is more excited about your wedding than five or six year olds like oh, they are definitely. just all about the party and the celebration yeah yeah it was really really sweet so and now they get to watch that back when they you know when they're older and they get to see themselves when they're five and just giving their vows and how sweet it was so it's a pretty cool experience for sure not to ramble on about this one of my favorite things that i brought from when i originally was doing weddings in scotland uh when they do the hand fasting and they tie with the cord the one thing that i started doing with families i thought was super fun is that each so if it was this family this wedding that you were at Mm -hmm. Each of the little girls would get to pick their own favorite color, and then the parents would pick their own favorite colors, and then you weave it into a cord, so you're always kind of woven together, and then when you tie an infinity knot, the girls would get to like tie it, so it creates that knot of foreverness yep. in the cord, and then that is something that can physically always be in the home, always your colors, always reminding them of, of that moment. It's like the wedding bands, but it also incorporates the little people. Oh, that's cute. What's the, like, the ceremonial moment when you put the cloth over as well? So, is that, it, it's like, similar. Yeah. Yeah, so the thing, like, hand fastings are almost like their own wedding topic. Like, there are a million different ways of doing it, um, a million different ways of doing it, mm -hmm. because different people have different ideas of what it is from, you know, very, very traditional, which is really kind of boring, to just simply integrating um, a cloth or a cord, um, and really personalizing that, that cloth cord. I had a couple who used their, they were a Korean couple, and they used their baby, their child's baby blanket as what wrapped their oh, hand, cute. right? Yeah. But, I mean, that's is where tying the knot comes from. That's the, that's the original tying of the knot. And it's just that physical, it's to make you physically get a sense of what you've just got. And when is that usually performed? Is it during vows or is it after the vows? Or does it depend? <laughs> it's open. It all, it all depends. Sometimes like if there are traditional vows where the tying is done one ribbon by one ribbon for each of the vows and each ribbon a different color representing a different aspect of your life, right? So that's where you kind of have the extreme hand fasting. It's a lot of ribbons. It's a repeating of vows. Um, they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of, they're very real vows. It's not, 
right uh, you know fluffy happy <laughs> love forever it's like basically will you cause her pain i might <laughs> <laughs> Is that your intention? No. And then you put the cord on, right? Like, oh, okay. No socks and dishes in this one. <laughs> right down to business. You can do it. I mean, there was a couple I married, they were doctors and they didn't have time to write their own vows, but they wanted it in that style. And so they trusted me to write, which I don't typically write their own vows, but I kind of really wanted to be creative with this one because I had just read a blog by a divorce lawyer who had written, this is what people really should have vowed in their, in their wedding vows. And so what I extracted from, he did these wedding vows and I extracted the information from them. So it was things like, I will not make major purchases without your <laughs> input, including animals, cars <laughs> so it's like the real um i promise to love you and your family for who they are even your uncle bob you know so it's like taking little it's really taking something actually quite serious and really meaningful in a vow but making it a little bit light and having that little bit of a jest at the end so it's kind of fun but and so it's called fa hand fasting that's right that's the name for it yeah, proper term? Hand fasting or um, there's another term for it too that, um, what is it called? There, there's several, I've got them on my website. I don't do them very often. Like I do the hand fastings quite often where mm -hmm. I tie, um, but there's other ones where you can use three chords and uh, it's called a unity knot, I think. So yes, the unity knot. Mm -hmm. So there's different terminology for different styles of doing it, but honestly, it, it can range, it can range. It can be a lot of fun. And you've done like every, almost every cultural background, have you not? Like you have quite the portfolio. I think I probably have done everything except for um, there's, because I was supposed to marry them down in uh, the Dominican mm -hmm. uh, because she was Hindu and he was like a Sri Lankan Christian that, wanted me to also bring in i believe it was the rooster but he wasn't sure why that was symbolic of all weddings um so i i never got to do that wedding it just didn't work out um but that was the one i was most intrigued by because i still to this day haven't figured out what that rooster has to do <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to know and i really want someone to come to me from like a from that Christian Sri Lankan environment say, I want you to marry us. And then I want to find out what is that rooster? You know? Well, if anybody's listening and knows the meaning of the rooster, <laughs> please tell Teddy. <laughs> and, and you know what? The, the thing that always um, surprises me is that no matter which culture or faith you're coming from, when it comes to a lot of the wedding ceremonies, and this is often what I'll bring up if there's a little bit of issues between the families and the wedding, is that ultimately they are the same because they're all guided under the idea that you're coming under one house mm -hmm. that you're there to love each other and your family that you're there to share nourishment food take care of one another like the foundation of love is limitless there's no culture there's no faith it's that's the you know that's the bond that's the love is love love I'm is love easy on you i'm sorry are you crying <laughs> Well, this has been such a pleasure to sit and chat with you and give some insight into this whole other world of ceremonies, which we haven't talked about on the podcast. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, but I can't let you go without knowing uh, either one, a story. So I'll give you two options. A story um, from something you've experienced recently, um, even during this quarantine time, or two, what your favorite quarantine activity is. <laughs> which one do you want? <laughs> I think I'll go with this, uh, if I, I'll go with the story. I'll go with the story. Love a story, go for it. Okay, so the Corona wedding time is always a little bit of chaotic and who knows what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but the one story that was kind of fun and crazy was the day that City Hall announced it was shutting down they decided that morning and they shut it down. 
and my phone blew up, blew up. Yep. And so the first call that came in was from um, a couple that were due to get married that day. She'd flown in from Singapore. He'd flown in from the UK. I forget where their friends had come in from. I think they were actually in Toronto. But they had just basically flown into Toronto to get married at City Hall that afternoon. And so the, the cousin called me in tears, in a panic. The day was ruined. And I said, no problem. I said, what do you want to do? And she said, can you come down to the lakeshore and just, you know, we're right at the hotel there, just come out and marry us on the, on the dock. And I'm like, absolutely, I'm on my way. In an hour or so, I forget how much time it was, they wanted to get married that afternoon. So then my phone rings again. Hi, we need to get married today. We don't have any witnesses. Um, can you help us? I said, oh, okay. If you can meet me down at the dock <laughs> <laughs> after this wedding and let me check. So I called the other couple back and I, and I said, would your witnesses be willing to stay to witness a second wedding on the dock after yours? And they said, absolutely no problem. Anything for you because you have saved us. <laughs> like oh, wow. anything you ask. I'm like, awesome, okay. So I called them back. We're good to go. I got your witnesses. Great. Phone rings again. Third couple. Third couple. We need to get married today. Can you help us out? Um, we don't have any witnesses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I call the second couple. Hi. Quick question. How would you feel about just staying after I do your ceremony and having you witness and sign the paperwork for the couple after you? absolutely came through because we didn't have any witnesses <laughs> so this is beautiful collaborative spontaneous um celebration of just being able to get married right it was very cool because everyone's going through the same thing at that point and so everybody needs help to get done what they need to get done so you had a chain of witnesses basically coming in the dock and coming up, going off the dock using our own pens, trying not to touch each other, yeah. um, because it's very hard for me not to hug people. Like I get in too close and then I realize I'm creeping them out and I got to back up a little. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, we played it safe, but uh, we just, everybody came through for one another and it was, it was a beautiful little, little moment. <laughs> That sounds really cute. The hard part is that like we as humans are conditioned to love and to want to touch each other and things like that. So this has been a transition, right? Of learning like, okay, now we need to keep our distance from everyone. And I think that's been mentally, that'll be pretty tough, especially for families. And, um, you know, that's definitely been a hard part, but um, so when was that? Was that right when things happened in March or was that when it got warmer? Was it chilly day on the dock? <laughs> Yeah, it was a chilly day on the dock, but it was, uh, it was March 19th. It was, okay. it was just a little bit of the wind coming off of the lake. We were, you know, yeah. it was chilly. I've got the photos on my Instagram. We weren't, like, they were in dresses and stuff. Okay. <laughs> on my, my little cape, so I'm a little bit warmer, but um, they didn't care. Like, I really was just, uh, thank goodness, we're actually, you know, getting this done. The first couple, that's what they had come in for. The second couple uh, realized that, they needed to get their immigration sorted or they were going to be separated completely mm. from one another. And the last couple, I don't even know why it was so urgent. They, they were both Canadians. They were an older couple, but they just looked at each other and just like mushed into each other's, like they, you know, when they just ooze that calm <laughs> little lovey mushy. Yeah. And it, you know, it could be something like purchasing property together or dealing with wills or dealing with health situations. You never know what like the urgent aspect of something is, and I often don't want to pry unless I can help expedite for a certificate. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's what that's what the season currently is. It's really exploring all the different kind of urgent things that come out of um, families and lives and life situations, and how marriage becomes essential yeah. for for helping that process along. Right? Yeah. Well, you're doing a fabulous job and anyone would be absolutely blessed to have you marry them because you are such a lovely, lovely person. So thank you for sitting on this call with me today and talking us through this. This has been fun. We've been learning a lot thank here. You. This has been fun. I need See? more of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now you're addicted to podcasts. <laughs> I was so scared. I was so scared. <laughs> It's fun. So I think everyone will enjoy it. So thank you so much and be safe.
safe and stay healthy out there. And we hope to see you again soon. You too. Okay. Cheers, my dear. Bye-bye. <laughs>